Hello, my name is Joshua Daniels and I'm an historian and filmmaker from Rotherham. Worsborough, like a lot of places in South Yorkshire, was heavily developed thanks to coal mines or coal pits or collieries as they're also known. With the development of pits came the development of the towns as more people moved here with their families so they could be close to the newly opened pits. As such, more houses were built in these areas, so of course more roads were built, and thus more transport was needed. Coal mining actually goes back to the Romans, and coal has been used for centuries for heating, especially in areas like South Yorkshire, where there was lots of coal beneath the surface. The Industrial Revolution was the worldwide development from a mainly agricultural society, that is farming, to an industrial way of life, so factories and mining and the, uh, <clears throat> and the like. This industrial revolution lasted from 1760 to around 1840. Before this, life was very different in Britain. Generally, people lived on farms and worked the land, making their own food. If they lived in cities, they generally worked in trade, and cities didn't fully develop until the Industrial Revolution. There was no electricity, and so people relied on fires in their homes. This also meant there were no powered machines, so a lot of things like houses, clothes and food had to be made by hand, which took a lot of effort and skill. And it meant that the quality of life was quite low compared to what it is today. Going back to transport, there wasn't tarmac like we have today. It was mainly dirt tracks and mud that linked farms and was used for trade routes. And a lot of these were based on Roman roads, with the oldest Roman road in Britain being nearly 2,000 years old. The houses weren't very nice. Village houses were made of timber and tiles. These were often smoke-filled from the fires. People sometimes slept in the same room. And it wasn't out of the ordinary for farm animals to also sleep in the houses as well. Children as young as five would help spin thread and help around the house, or go onto the farm doing tasks like pulling weeds or milking the cows, although that task was generally for the girls. Because people were generally poorer, everyone had to work both in and out of the house, and that is everyone in the house, so the children, the men and the women. They lived in very bad conditions. Disease was rife. There were no toilets in the homes, and medicine could have been as gross as using leeches to try and suck what they thought was tainted blood out of a victim. They grew everything themselves, but sometimes the food wasn't enough or wasn't very nice. And a diet for a peasant could consist mainly of cabbage, beans and or bread. Then there was the transport. Before the Industrial Revolution, there was no engine and no electricity. And so there were no cars or trams or planes. <clears throat> so... Mud paths and river transport was used. On the ground, people would sometimes travel by foot if they really had to. However, if they had up to a ton in cargo, a lot of transport was done by mules or horses. They would load bags of goods, whether it be food or resources or manufactured goods such as clothes, and put them in sacks and travel for miles to sell their items. They also used wagons or carts, which would have been pulled by horses or mules and would have had all their goods on them. However, because these carts were heavy and the roads were generally mainly mud, the paths they took started to become unusable as they were too worn down, and so they started building bridges to go over rivers. Before this, river transport was quite extensive in Britain, with horses or men pulling them on what were called towpaths, which ran alongside the rivers, or they'd push the boat along in a method called punting. However, this started to decline after the building of bridges, and after rivers started to be used for mills instead as well. This brings us nicely to what life would have been like in the Industrial Revolution. <laughs>
In the 1700s, stagecoaches, as they were called, meant that much more could be transported, and much more regularly. Roads were improved, and so more could be taken, and there were more people on the roads, as they started to use stones instead of just mud. Then, there was the building of the canals. Canals had been used for centuries, but it was in the period from 1760s until the 1790s did the most canal building take place. Unlike rivers which were naturally formed, canals were man-made waterways. Canals were better for transport than rivers because barges, essentially big boats, were used which could carry more weight. Plus, they were built specifically with destinations in mind, namely places of industry. And so instead of having to go where the river went, the canal could go to wherever the owner or the builder wanted it to go. Canals were used heavily in places like South Yorkshire, as they would take on coal, iron and manufactured goods from places like factories, mines or ironworks. They would build these canals that went to where the industry was, load everything onto the barges and take fuel like coal and things that needed to be deposited off the barge, and then take these loads and sell them off abroad or across the country. On the land, there was the development of what were in early industrial wagonways, also called tramways, but not the tramways we might think of today. These were similar to mine carts and were used to transport goods and materials between industrial sites. So what you found was that when mines and factories were, were built, they would build these tramways or wagonways to transport stuff between them. And mines would often be used to dig up the resources, such as coal or iron, stone ore, and then they would transport that to the factories. And then the goods that are made at the factories were then transported via these wagonways to places like canal basins. These wagonways began mostly in the late 1700s. They used tracks to go from one place to another and were at first horse-drawn before, using the, before a lot of them started using the steam engine to pull and push the wagons. You might be thinking these are similar to trains, to railways, and indeed you'd be right, these were essentially the precursor to railways. Railways were very important, not just to South Yorkshire, but to the country and its development as a whole. They came about primarily because of the invention of the steam engine. Trains could carry a lot more goods than canals could, and also much quicker. Thus, in the early 1800s, they started to build lots of railways across the country. Thanks to this, towns and cities across England started to develop as people could move more, make more, and of course, make more money. However, while industry developed because of transport, transport also definitely developed because of industry. In places like South Yorkshire, there was a lot of coal near the surface and deep underground. Coal was very important to the Industrial Revolution, as it was burned in the furnaces, which would have melted the iron ore to make iron, and also used in newer inventions, such as the steam engine, which would have powered the trains and ships. Coal, therefore, made up a lot of the jobs in Industrial Revolution Britain, as it required a lot of men and machinery to get to it, get it out of the ground, and get it transported. Up until 1843, it was actually still legal for men, for women and children under 10 to work in the pits. Working in a pit was dangerous and very tough. Before 1843, whole families would have worked together underground with different roles in order to be able to afford to live. Children from five to eight years old would have had jobs underground and worked for 12 hour shifts. These jobs included working as trappers, 
so-called because they opened trap doors to let fresh air into the pit. They were generally sat in darkness for hours on end and were paid less than their adult counterparts. Men would work at the coal face with a pick for hours on end and in very hot conditions, with some pits being wet and dusty, some pits being wet and hot, and others being dusty, but all being very hot. They would get lung problems from inhaling all the material that would come up when they dug up the coal, such as dust, and would sometimes work semi-naked just to escape the heat. There were also numerous accidents, ranging from roof collapses to explosions. However, the coal industry, especially in Yorkshire, led to the development of towns and villages across the UK, as areas that were once totally agricultural then became, became dependent on coal mines. The owners of the mines often built the owners of the mines often built homes for their workers and the workers' families, which led to an increase in population in these areas as people moved in from other places so they could be closer to the collieries for work. So with the opening of pits, there was an increase in houses being built. And with the increase in houses came the increase in other parts of village and community life, such as pubs. Pubs were genuinely really important for communities, as it was a place where workers could go after a tough shift, or families could meet up and have a place to enjoy themselves. So life in coal mining villages would have been very close, and everyone would have known each other. And when you see pubs nowadays, you can think that these pubs would have generally gone back to the Industrial Revolution and the development of industries such as coal mining, because that would have been where people would have developed social lives. However, because mining was so deadly, there would have been a lot of death and accidents in these towns. And so you'll find a lot of memorials nowadays to the people who lost their lives in the pit, as accidents were unfortunately quite common. Thanks to this industry, though, the transport of goods had been improved because they had the technology to do so and the necessity to do so, so they could transport more goods. Plus, this also meant the improvement of transport of people, so the, not just the improvement of transport of goods and resources, but the improvement of transport of people as well. Before the Industrial Revolution, there was no such thing, really, as public transport. Initially, trains only had second and third class, so trains as a method of human transportation, especially for the working class, didn't really emerge until the creation of third class travel in 1838. However, a lot of these had no roofs, or some of them didn't even have doors and so were more like transporting animals than people. However, the Industrial Revolution saw the improvement of transport across the board, and also more access to this transport. This is apparent in the development of other forms of transport, namely buses and trams. Buses were solely used for transporting people, which is what makes them so special and unique in history. They started in 1824 and were first pulled by horses. There were some steam buses in the 1830s, but motor-engined buses, so of course those that used petrol, were more successful, as they appeared from 1897. However, buses were used, and more so today than ever, more in London than anywhere else. Sometimes buses were used in the 20th century to get workers from specific places in mining villages, take them to the colliery, and then take them back so they'd have specific bus stops in mining villages where people would have gone on the bus and then gone to work. Buses unlock the ability to what we call commute, that is, live elsewhere and get to their jobs via public transport. Buses were really the first 
proper public transport, as they could transport large groups of people in ways that trains couldn't. Tramways were also used in the 1800s, firstly being horse-drawn and some being steam-powered, but most were electric later on. The first public tramway opened in Blackpool in 1885. Other methods had been tried, but electric overhead wires were the most common ways of powering these trams. Ultimately, trams became overshadowed by the use of buses, because buses were more flexible, and also not everywhere could get access to the trams. However, the importance of trams and buses was that people did not have to live directly where they worked, and also meant that those who did live nearby could get to work quicker. Which brings us onto the case of, of Wordsborough. Wordsborough was shaped by a lot of these factors, and a lot of its history can be summed up by public transport, collieries, the canal, and mills. Wordsborough, however, has a history dating back to the Romans, where it was settled and used for things such as farming. It would have been much different to what it looks like today. It was mainly agricultural, but also had a fort and much less people. This is actually where the name comes from. It was recorded as Wurzburg, with Work being the landowner and Burr meaning fortified settlement. There was also a mill recorded in 1086 too. So not only did Wurzburg have mining as an industry, but for over a thousand years at least, it had milling. St Mary's Church dates back to at least the 1100s, but there's evidence that it goes back to over 1,000 years ago. Churches are important places because they were where people would come together to worship, and religion was a huge part of people's lives and how places were governed in medieval Britain. There are some significant historic sites in Wordsborough, with Hound Hill being a Tudor farmhouse and the tower being built in the 1600s during the English Civil War. Also in the 1600s, Wordsborough Hall was built to house local wealthy landowners and those that work for them. However, it was the coal mining that ultimately defined Wordsborough's story. Barrow Colliery was located at Wurzburgh Bridge and was founded in 1875. It gets its name from the company that founded it, the Barrow Hematite Steel Company. Barrow Colliery was one of the largest employers of the area. It closed in 1985 after the miners' strike and after the coal industry of Britain started to go into decline. Then there was also Darley Main Colliery, which is now where Wordsborough Dale Park is situated. It's located in Wordsborough Dale. This was sunk in 1849 and only, and only lasted until 1886. The so-called Jarrett's buildings where today you can see they were located near Green Street in Wordsborough Dale, were built in the 1850s to accommodate mine workers at Darley Main, as the Jarrett's were the, old, were the ones who leased the pit. Darley Main Colliery suffered a disaster in January 1849, when an explosion took the lives of 75 people, with the youngest being only 11 years old. Other industries, of course, included milling. Milling had been an industry in Wordsborough since before 1086, but the location is unknown and that mill no longer exists. Wordsborough Mill is a flour mill and the oldest part, simply called Old Mill, dates back to 1625. This houses the water wheel and the miller and his family would have lived here 
before the mill house was built in the 1700s. In the 1840s, the new mill was built next to the old mill, powered by a steam engine. It still ground corn and oats for animal feed for nearby farmers until as late as the 1960s. It was reopened at a museum in 1976. In the mid-1700s, Barnsley's main transport was the poor quality roads, but the coal here, such as in Wordsborough, but in Barnsley as a whole, was worth getting. As such, in 1792, plans were put in motion to create the Dern and Dove Canal for the transport of coal. The Wordsborough Canal Basin was opened in 1804, but closed in 1906. Wordsborough Reservoir was constructed in 1793 with the purpose of supplying water for the Dern and Dove when it was to open. Also at Wordsborough Bridge was a lesser known and less visible industry, glassworks. Glassworks was quite a prominent industry in Barnsley anyway. These glassworks established in 1828 with the Wood Brothers Glassworks. They were situated at Wordsborough Bridge, where there was a flint glass house, and it carried on until 1981. Then there was the transport. The South Yorkshire Railway joined Wordsborough in 1854, although this was goods only, meaning that people were transported on it. The part of the Trans-Pennine Trail today is on the old railway line. There was also a wagonway which connected coal and ironstone mines near Rockley and Pilly to the Wordsborough Canal Basin. There were at least three of these wagonways in Barnsley in the seven, early 1800s. The public transport was so paramount to Wordsborough, however, in particular the trams, because it enabled freedom of movement. Trams weren't just for those working at the collieries, but also just the average person too. There were reports of miners sitting in their mucky clothes, getting on the trams as they sat next to everyone else who was going on a day out. A lot of the trams went to and from Barnsley Town Centre. That was another important feature of the trams. They enabled people who otherwise could not have got to Barnsley Town Centre to get out and about, but the transport links were not just were just not there, and cars were not a possibility. So the building of the trams enabled people to get a day out, and were not just seen as a way of enabling workers to get to work, but also people wanted to do something as simple as shopping too. It must have been a popular line, as owing to a shortage of cars in 1967, services were only permitted between Eldon Street in Barnsley and the two termini, so stops, at Wordsborough. There was one at Wordsborough Bridge and one at Wordsborough Dale. The last century saw the closing of the railway, the tramway, the trams and the industry, but also the building of houses and opening of the mill as a museum. All the while in the surrounding areas, there's a lot of farmland and green spaces, and there's a lot of places now where people can go and walk or see the local history. Some of that history, however, is hidden, and it's up to us to see where we can find it and see how we can make use of it and see how we can help it to be remembered. The public transport linked all of these different walks of life together, as well as linking Wordsborough to Barnsley and Barnsley to Wordsborough. Not only did the public transport help people get to work, it helped people get out of Wordsborough and get people into Wordsborough for shopping, for see family, for days out. Scattered across Barnsley, a visible and sometimes invisible parts of heritage. But in Wordsborough, they all tell their stories and they were all linked thanks to public transport. <laughs>